Good morning. We are going to, I assume anyway, finish chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians today. That's the plan. We made it as far as verse 11, so we'll begin with verse 12. So we're in 12, 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. That's where we are this morning. So let's pray. Lord God, as we look into your word, Lord, we pray that you would look into our heart. And Lord, that you would search us and know us and see if there be any wicked way within us. Lord, we want to just be right with you. Ask you, Lord, to just bless us. Just equip us. And then, Lord, to use us for your glory. So, Lord, further gift us, further equip us as we look at your word this morning. And bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking about the body this morning, as verse 12 says, for, the, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So you see the bouncing back and forth. You feel like you just play ping pong? From one to all, to all, to one, to many, to some. No, not some. It's all. Right? All is all. And that's what the point that Paul is making here. And he's going to go in from here to talk about using the body as a picture. As an analogy of what he's talking about. How... Our body isn't all just one thing, all an eye or all an ear or whatever, but it's many parts. And so that's the way that we are as believers. However you want to look at the body of Christ, the church, it's a group of individuals that have different giftings. Remember, we're in the context of spirituals or spiritual gifts. And how every one of us is different. We're all different. Yet, we're all one. We're not supposed to all be clones of the other. You know, if you were all just like me, oh, how awesome that would be. Right? No. Not at all. You know? We cannot do that. But it's amazing how often, and, and I guess... You know, because Paul did say, follow me as I follow Christ. He said that of himself. He said, I want to be an example, and so we all should be. And as we look at the attributes that each one has, you know, it's, it's kind of, I wish I was more like this. That happens. Or I wish I was more like her or like him in the way that they do this or do that. And, you know, <laughs> examples that way, those are good things to look at. But at the same time, recognizing that the Spirit of God dwells within us, each one of us. And that God has uniquely gifted each one of us for the circumstances in which we find ourselves. I cannot interject into your circumstance better than you can, into your sphere of influence, your family, your friends, your neighbors, God has gifted you and placed you where you are for that purpose. And the reality that we all are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are. You know what? To realize that and to walk in that day by day. That God has a plan every day. He wants to use us. Wherever we end up going. And that's why Jesus said, you think about this, he said, it's expedient for me that I go away. Why? Because if he didn't go away, he would not send the Holy Spirit. Who is with you and will be in you. You know, that whole section of John 15, 16 through there. Well, Jesus said, I'm going away. Because otherwise, because he also was had taken on flesh as God and he's there in one place at one time. 
said, but if I go away and send the Spirit, then that's not the whole world. And you all have the Spirit within you. So now the, the ministry of Jesus can be spread throughout the whole world. It isn't all being focused on Him. So if He were here, that's what we do. We build our shrines and we go focus and, you know, all about Him and where He is. But now He's within us. God is in us. And so we all have the opportunity to represent Him, to be ambassadors of heaven. Of the kingdom of God, we can all do that. So, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all, past tense, baptized into one body. And this here, this had to be a, quite the revelation to the Corinthians and the Christians of that time. Whether Jews or Greeks, it doesn't matter. You know, or whether slaves or free, it doesn't matter. One body and have all been made to drink into one spirit, for in fact the body is not one member but many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? You know, these, these questions that he begins asking, you know, just to get us to think about that. Well, I'm not a hand. I'm not useful like the hand. I can't grip a tool and I can't do all these things. I'm just a foot, you know. I can't do anything. But wait, that hand isn't going very far. It doesn't have a foot. You know, and how we are all necessary, all interconnected. You know, that's the point he's making. Then, If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? You know, when you think about your ear, you know, important peace that ear to be able to hear and how it's designed what, what an amazing thing the design of god isn't it anatomy you know just thinking about that i looked up the word anatomy this week and thinking about this whole context of the body and you know generally speaking when we talk about anatomy just a general thing we've got head and, and the neck and the trunk the upper limbs and the lower limbs and that's you know that's very general but you know you think about that how how amazing our body is you know where we all started right one cell fertilized egg in our in the womb of our mom you ever thought about that i looked up see how big that is it's 100 microns does that help you didn't help you a bit. <laughs> 100 microns <laughs> No other cell is anywhere near that big, though. It's uh, roughly the thickness of a strand of hair or the size of a grain of sand. And I like to think about that. You know, just think of it. We all started there, that little teeny thing. And look at some of us have a little more than others, <laughs> but you know, we've all we've all grown and expanded from that tiny little grain of sand size single cell isn't that amazing to think about and how as it grows and as it develops you get the other systems it's bones just look at that you know, bones grow out of that what a miraculous thing the body is and joints and muscles and then the Elementary system. You know, I sound smart now. I don't even know what that means, but it's <laughs> it's the gastrointestinal tract. And the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, you think about that, you know. From that one little grain of sand, how everything grows. Well the respiratory system. So we can breathe, bring oxygen in. And then you have the <clears throat> urinary system with your kidney and stuff so we can filter out harmful things the reproductive systems so we can reproduce create others the whatever that says <laughs> I, I wrote it in my handwriting on a little piece of paper here it's the uh, abdominal pelvic cavity that that part of our body. Just think of how, from that little thing, how everything develops. And you know, in a, a baby, 
It's a rule. What is it? The four weeks, the heart's beating or something like that. Brain waves are detectable after a few weeks. How quickly it develops and grows and such. How can anyone say that life does not begin at conception? When you think of what happens in that short amount of time in the development that occurs. Then the, we have the endocrine system with the glands and the pituitary gland, the thyroid, things like that. The cardiovascular system, your heart, your veins, your arteries, the lymphoid system, and the nervous system, you know, your brain, your spinal cord, and nerves. And then with the sense organs, your eyes, your ears, your taste buds, your nose, you know, and, and through the nervous system, the touch. Think of the touch we have with our fingertips, how sensitive that is. It's amazing our body is. And then the integumentary system, or whatever that is. Oh, I don't even think I'm saying that right, but it's your skin, isn't it? Your skin, your fingernails, things like that. All from that one little human egg that is 100 microns. Four times bigger than a skin cell, 26 times bigger than a red blood cell, but still so small, the size of a grain of sand. It's amazing to me. And I think it thought about it this way too. This grain of sand that came from my mom that became me, you know, she was in her mom and my dad was in his mom and it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Where it's God who formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And breathed into him the breath of life. And from him cut him right in two. And from Adam made woman, made Eve. And then from there, we're all, we were all in Adam. We were all in Eve. We're all descendants of theirs. And this great plan that God has down through the centuries, through the ages, to where we are today, still linked all the way back to where God formed us out of the dust of the ground. That's an amazing thing to think about to me. But using the analogy of the body and using that to represent who we are in Christ, how important it is to have all our parts working, because we've all seen people who are damaged, people who have had things break down. And really, that's the way we are as a church when people aren't here. We're missing parts, you know, and I don't like missing parts. I like all of them. I love every system, especially this one <laughs> but every system you know, to be able to see and that's important that we can see things that we're aware of things but to be able to hear to be able to touch that's a hard thing we can't all touch people but we well, I mean we all can but I can't touch everybody or you can't touch everybody, but together we can influence a whole group of people. We all are so important. So, I'm sure in Corinth, there was quite a fight going on. You know that these people were a rowdy bunch. And they're all saying, unless you're like me, then you're not a part of the body of Christ. I'm sure that's what was going on. That's why he's spending all this time expressing to us how God has made us uniquely, how God has made us individually, so we understand how important we are to the mission that God has given us. Because we're intended to be a living organism. This is not an organization. The church is not this building. It's you. It's me. It's us. It's people. The church is people. And together as an organism, working together, all pulling in the same direction, we can accomplish much. And that's his point. Again, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? 
But now God, and that's key thing, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. God's the one that's in control. He's the one that puts us together. He's the one that has us, has gifted us, has equipped us, has put us where we are in our circumstances for his purposes. And then all we have to do is comply and say, God, use me. How do you want to use me? What do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do this week? Is there anything I need to be preparing for? Oh boy, what can I do to glorify you in my life today? And if they were all one member, where would the body be? That'd be kind of funny looking, wouldn't it? One big ear walking down the street, you know, it'd be kind of weird. not how he designed it at all. It's so different. It's so unique. But now indeed there are many members yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor can the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You know, we need every part. I was thinking about parts though. You know that there's only two parts of our body that can interchange. You snickering at that. <laughs> it's true. See, your nose and your foot, they can change. Did you know that? Because your nose runs and your feet smell. You know this, right? <laughs> so they're interchangeable. <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> actually, I think how it goes is. If your nose runs and your feet smell, you're built upside down. That's really what you anyway. It's hard though, but this is what happens. Because what, you know, so often in churches, in groups of people, the majority of the work is done by a few. And so you have someone who is the eyes doing the work of the ears, or, or someone who is the hands doing the work of the feet, and, or someone who is the feet doing the work of the hands, or whatever, you know? And, and it's not like you can't. I mean, I've seen people walk on their hands. You can get that done, you know? Or if you're blind, you know, you use your hearing. Or if you're deaf, you use your sight a lot more in, in other senses. But when our body is working as it should, every part supplying what is needful, no longer handicapped. You know, makes sense, doesn't it? Things work much better. Not that things can't be accomplished. If there's injury, or if there's damage, or if there's separation, those things do happen. But it's tragic when that happens. It's a sad thing. It's hard. And so we need each other. And that's what that's the point that the Lord is making through Paul here. I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. How can we ever say that? No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it that there should be no schism in the body, but, the mem but that the members should have the same care one for another. It's hard. People are people, you know. I mean, you guys get along great. Like we were saying, the fellowship, it's always wonderful. You know, we all get along, but it, I've been there. I've been in churches where there's schisms. I've been where there's, I can't stand that person, you know, or whatever. And it shouldn't be like that. There are times, certainly, we can grate on each other. You know, that happens. But it should not be. You know, and that's a time to pray and get back, get our, get our head back on straight, you know. There shouldn't be a schism, but that the members should have the same care for one another. We need to care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer. 
Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. It is amazing, isn't it? How if one part suffers. As I was coming up here, and it's still there, I got an itch between my big toe and the one next to it. And it's amazing how that draws all your attention, isn't it? It doesn't have to be serious suffering, it's just a little itch in there, and I want to kick my shoe off and just scratch a little bit. You know how that, that feels? Isn't it like crazy? But, you know, if one member suffers, my son yesterday, he dropped the, his uh, dryer on my finger. It's a little black and blue. Here. You know, I get your attention when those things happen. Or a thumb, right? Oh. <laughs> you know? Doesn't have to be a big thing, but boy, we're so aware of things when they happen like that. And that's the way it should be, though, as members of the body of Christ. When there's a part that's suffering, we're all suffering. We need to be aware and certainly involved to the degree we're able. Or if one member is honored. Well, that ain't no place for envy. <laughs> it certainly happens sometimes, but no, it, it's not a time to be envious when someone receives an honor, when someone is blessed in some way or another. But all the members rejoice because, hey, we're all in this together, you know? And so that's the point, is how we need to work together and be used by the Lord together for His glory. Let the focus be His, because He's put us together the way He has. You know, what, what part are we, though? Who are we? You know, and so many times when you're talking about spiritual gifts, what is my gift? I can remember thinking that years ago. God, what is my gift? Or gifting. I figured <coughs> I must be a blister or something. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe a, a corn or something. I don't know. I used to bug people, I think. But what is your gift, you know? And but the reality is just this. We just need to rest in the fact, as it says in verse 27, you are the body of Christ. That's it. That's the main point to me. I know I'm saved. I know that God loves me. I know that Jesus died for me. I know I've been washed in his blood. It's all about him. And what I want to be is just available. And God, I don't know what gifting you've given me. I know he has given me the ability to speak in front of people. And I know it came from him. Ask Jean, she knows how much stage fright I used to have. I couldn't get out in front of two people, let alone more. I don't know how big a crowd I've spoken in front of. It's hundreds of people I have done that. And it just doesn't matter. Although I'll tell you this, as long as it's this, as long as it's God's word, if you want me to get out in front of people and talk about any other topic, I can't do it. I get so nervous. I can't even think straight. I can't talk at all. But, you know, if it's to talk about the Lord, it's his gifting. To whatever degree it is a gift, it's his, you know. But that's it. I just want to be used by him. And we're the body of Christ. And I like to pull that out and I go back a chapter into verse, I mean, into chapter 11. You know, when we're talking about communion. I always keep this in mind in verse 29 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. It says, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I always look at it that way, the body of Christ, not paying attention to each other. Remember in context in that chapter, he's talking about how some people, they go and they grab all the food right at the beginning of uh, their uh, potluck or whatever, take all the food for themselves and gorge it themselves while other people are going hungry. And then how, um, well, just all that. How they're not being kind to one another, but everybody acting so selfishly. And I, I really take it this way. 
as far as communion, you know, yes, we have to discern the Lord's body, but he is the one that was beaten and crushed and tortured and killed on our behalf. And I, I certainly want that in that there, but also to remember that we are the body of Christ. And it's as much an insult to God when we don't consider one another as it is when we don't consider him. Further evidence of that, Matthew chapter 25, another place I often think about. In Matthew 25, talking about the separating of the sheep and the goats, verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. And that's such an important passage of scripture in my life, in my thought process. You know, every single person is significant. There is no such thing as an insignificant individual. That's why it's so tragic when we get talking about abortion. That's why that is so horrific to me. Because each one is significant before God. Or, on the other side of life, when they talk about euthanasia, wanting to, <clears throat> if someone gets too sick or whatever, and they want to just help them die. Some of the most significant things that have happened to me have happened in experiences at the end of someone's life. Like my mom, the last time I saw her alive, and she was speaking. Uh, she went into a coma three days before she died, but she's laying there in the hospital. She knows she's dying of cancer. She knows it's happening. Um, she was just a, a shell of her former self. You know, cancer is such an insidious disease, and how, how destructive it is. And she's laying there in that state, and I'm sure she's drugged out, but in pain still. It has to be. And we're visiting, and she asked Jean if she would make mittens for my two youngest brothers. And I'm thinking, here you are, about to die. We all know you're about to die, and you're concerned still about these things. I can't tell you what that did for me and does for me when I think about important others were to my mom. You know, what a, what a significant thing. Or when Jean's Aunt Vera was passing away and we went to see her, and I've shared this with you, I think, before, some of you anyway, but she's laying there and she's about to die. She died three or four days later. And I told her, I, I was a brand new Christian, I didn't know anything. I was Catholic though, so I know a few things. I knew the Lord's Prayer. And so I said, you know, and that's what we always did as Catholics. You just mindless, vain repetition. That's what it is. You don't really think about what you're saying. You just say it. But anyway, that's what I, that's what I do. So I just said, Vera, I want to pray for you before we go. Because she was a Christian lady. She loved the Lord. But I remember her. Last image I have of her. Those hands shaking as she used all the strength she had. She wanted to get her hands up and put together. So she could pray with me. And that just, you know, those are significant events. And 
we're going to go and give somebody a shot because no longer productive to society, we miss out on so many key things. Opportunities that people have to say things that they wouldn't have a chance to say. You know, it's, it's just wrong. Everybody is precious. And God is in control of when we are born and when we die. And he will take care of it. And he will not give us more than we can handle. It's true, you know. He does not. He's not cruel. He's loving. And he knows what we're going through. And he has a purpose for it. Like we said in Sunday school, you know, Billy Graham dying at 99. Billy's been sick a long time. There's some purpose to it, though. It has to be why God allowed it to be now, at this time. There's somebody somewhere that's going to get saved because Billy hung on for an extra couple of years when basically he was in a lot of pain, I'm sure. A lot of, you know, I wonder if he even wondered. I doubt it because that doesn't seem to be Billy's character. But, you know, why am I still here, Lord? Isn't it time for me to come home? You know, but the timing is of the Lord. We're the body of Christ. That's who we are. We're his. And he'll take care of us. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you know that verse. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. So God is the one that has gifted each one. I know this. I have. I can operate in some of those things, but some of them it ain't me. Um, certain people are just great administrators. And that's such a gift to the Lord, to be able to manage resources. And to be able to schedule things and organize things. Some people are gifted at that. Others forget it. It's just not their gift, you know. Or helps. Just to be able to serve. Just to do things. Just to help. Well, there's a need over here or a need over there. Yeah, I can supply that need. And we'll take care of it. Not with fanfare. Not with everybody. Oh, look what I'm doing, you know. Not blowing the trumpet like they do when they're... The uh, Pharisees would dump their offering into the box in the temple, you know. Oh, look at me, look what I'm doing. Isn't that? <clears throat> you know, those people that do those things. The different parts. And I, I've said this before, I think we all have a main emphasis, but I think we can all operate at times in other areas that are listed here. But yet, Keep in mind, as verse 29 says, though, are all apostles? These are rhetorical questions, and certainly the answer is no to each one of these. Are all <coughs> apostles? No, not everybody is. We could be sent, that's what an apostle is, one who was sent out. We could be sent out as a missionary. It's that type of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. I know when our sons were in college, they had a missionary come to the Bible college, and his mindset was, if you are not going on the missionary field, there's something wrong with you. No, there was something wrong with him. Not everybody's called to be a missionary. They're just not. We all have different, different gifts and different ministries. So, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? Those who speak for God? Yes, if we define that as one who speaks for the Lord, we are all called to do that. But some are especially gifted, like a Billy Graham. Look at the influence that he was able to have. I'm not Billy Graham. I'm never going to be Billy Graham. I'm never going to be like him. Nor do I have the goal to be like him. Although I want to walk as he walks, serving the Lord, certainly. I'm not going to have the same emphasis he had. But yeah, I am called, and we're all called, to go into all the world to preach the gospel to every living creature. So in that context, yes, we're all prophets. But some people are especially gifted to do that, like Billy Graham. Like Franklin is, his son, like so many others. You know? Are all teachers? No.
some people they don't the thought of having to get up and talk in front of a group of people petrified I used to be there do I get to do that no no all teachers are all workers of miracles no do all have gifts of healings no do all speak with tongues no though so there are those churches who say if you don't you're not saved isn't that amazing but here in this whole list of rhetorical questions is that one isn't it nice that's there just so we can have that understanding that no does it mean that some don't know or that nobody should no it doesn't mean that either but we'll deal with that in a couple of weeks um, do all interpret no but earnestly desire the best gifts and yet I show you a more excellent way so a couple things in that verse it's okay to desire a gift earnestly desire God I want to be used by you know it's interesting nobody's ever gonna say God I want to be used for your purpose by having a gift and have that not be some desire that he's put in your heart it's just not in our nature our nature as humans is selfish self-centeredness and so if we are earnestly coveting a gift from the Lord it's the Lord working in us as we had Wednesday night that verse which we didn't get to but I don't remember what exactly how it is but I happen to have the book right here so. <laughs> it's Psalm 37 verses 4 and 5 delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean he's going to write, give you a blank check. There you go. You get whatever you want. No. The desires that are in your heart, he will give you. If you delight yourself in the Lord. And so if the <coughs> desire is in your heart to be used by the Lord in a certain way, it's because he's, you've delighted yourself in him. He's given you that desire. And so earnestly desire the best gifts. The best gifts. What are the best gifts? It's not tongues. It's not at all. Because the tongues is a, a language. It's a praise language. It's a prayer language. That's all it is. And we'll make that case a couple of weeks again, as I said. So that's not the best gift. It is a gift, though. It's a big gift of the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. But the best gifts, I mean, healings, those are good gifts. Oh, yeah. I want to pray for people. I want to see you move on their behalf. Not that I get the praise. Not that I get the glory. The Lord that you do. Or miracles. Or prophecy. Being able to oh, help me to be able to communicate in such a way that people hear how much you love them. So that they would turn to you and get saved. Lord, I want them to spend eternity with, with me in heaven. You know, those are good gifts to desire. And, I mean, nothing wrong with being one who's sent out either. That's a good gift. Lord, I'd love to go to the missionary field. I don't see how it's ever going to happen. How do I get there? But Lord, you could use me in that way. Show me how to get there. I want to take what you've given me and use it for your glory. And so to earnestly desire the best gifts, those are those are good things to do. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. Which is the lead in. Because you know the chapter, the first divisions, those are not here <coughs> for any other purpose than so that we can say, turn to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, you know, or whatever. Uh, they're not inspired and the break sometimes and not in the best place not that this is a bad one but the more excellent way that we go into talk and a discussion about love and the point and that's what we'll do next week is talk about that but love that's the more excellent way because though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love I am becoming sounding brass or a clanging cymbal I met those Christians <laughs> that are just a whole bunch of noise because they have no love you know no love at all and that's the most important thing in fact the evidence 
of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues, but it is love one for another. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It is love. It, love manifests itself in joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all those other, um, that list in Galatians 5, 22, 23. Um, but it's love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. A concern for other people. If you don't have that, they don't have anything. I don't care what gift you have. If you don't have love, what good is it? It's no good at all. So that's the most excellent way. That's the emphasis. That's where we have to be. Lord, teach me to be like you. I was thinking how much he loved me and how much he loved you. How much does God love us? You can't even comprehend it. But we'll talk about love, what it is, agape love. Certainly there's different types of love. This is agape, other centered, the God kind of love. Not phileo, not eros, not those other words they had for love. Like we, you know, us in our language, we love everything from potato chips to our spouses. You know, it's, <laughs> the, I, we use that word for things that it should not be applied to. But I do love food. Anyway, let's all stand and we'll pray. Close with him. 410. Like the little shotgun. My faith looks up to you. together today. Thank you for calling us into your precious kingdom. We're part of the body of Christ. What an awesome thing to consider. And Lord, as a part of your body, please use us. Help us, Lord, to be the ones that supply what is needful for the rest, so that all together, Lord, we can be used by you for your glory. Lord, bless us as we go. Keep us safe and bring us safely back together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.